Hello everyone and welcome to episode 21 of the IWFM webinar series. Again, a bit like me, I'm sure you're thinking uh, where has time gone as we're now on the 1st of October. Um, today's webinar is going to be a very intriguing um, debate around the issue around sustainability, looking at today's landscape and, and how to create change in partnership with Enenco. At this point, I want to say a massive thank you to Enenco, who's been our partners on our 13th survey of our sustainability survey, which has actually been supported by our special interest group, of which one of our speakers today is Greg Davis. So I'll go on to the speakers next. Um, so I'm Peter Brogan, Head of Research and Insight at the IWFM. And as you can imagine, FM and workplace professionals have a massive role to play when it comes to sustainability agenda. Only of last week, we had our IWFM conference where we had a keynote speaker, Penn Heddo, who's actually done the South Pole at, um, exploration. He's actually explored there, the rising sea levels, the ice disappearing. We know climate change and sustainability is a massive issue. So hopefully today you will find from our survey results, which the report has actually been launched today and will be available on our website today. So please look out that with partnership with Enenco. Um, really as a massive issue for, for facilities management and workplace and the role we have to play. So hopefully this webinar will help to how you possibly can create change. And obviously with the economic and social conditions we all find ourselves in at the moment, how will potentially the sustainability agenda um, change in the future. So we're going to explore that. I just want to remind listeners, viewers, this present uh, webinar is being recorded. So please uh, send through your questions as much as we can. We, we have got a questions section dedicated at the end of this webinar. So I'll be hosting it today. But more importantly, I'd like to introduce the two speakers we've got today. Um, Greg Davis, Chair of the Sustainability SIG, and Duncan Edward, Head of New Business and Partnerships and Nenco Group. So Greg, I'd just like to uh, kick off with your dear self, if you'd just like to introduce yourself to the viewers, listeners, and I'll, I'll be asking the same, Duncan, if that's okay from you. So Greg, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name's Greg Davis. Um, I'm Director of Market Development at a health, safety, environment consultancy called Assurity Consulting. Um, been there for 30 years. Uh, one of my roles within that, um, they, they kind, kindly let me volunteer um, for the IWFM, and I've been on the Sustainability Special Interest Group Committee for, I think, the last 10 years. I've been chair for the last year. I've the honorary chair for the last year and I've also been survey lead on the sustainability um, survey for the last six or seven years so it, it is something that is dear to my heart um, in my broader remit either for the IWFM or or actually um, my day job I have had dealings with DEFRA, DEC as was and the Committee on Climate Change um, on various issues uh, relating to red tape challenge to water. So, so I've got a fairly broad background in the subject area. Uh, fortunately, also have a number of other people on the committee who are um, subject matter leads and experts in, in other areas of sustainability. So we bring it all together quite nicely. And thank you, Greg. And you've all obviously had the pleasure of working with me for six years. Of course. <laughs> and I've mentioned Enenco, obviously a key partner on our survey this year, which Greg will be go, giving you some highlights from that. But Dun Duncan, if I can introduce introduce yourself, if if you can, please, just just to the viewers and audience. Of course. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as it says, Duncan Edward, Head of New Business and, and Partnerships uh, here at Enenco. Um, only been a short time uh, with Enenco, uh, 12 months, uh, September last year was when I joined. Um, and a short term time learning uh, the, the industry. I've been in the energy industry about five years. Um, previous experience um, held corporate senior roles with, with Canon, the camera photocopier company, and um, Vodafone, and um, also had a, a stint in professional sport, um, professional rugby with, with the Newcastle Falcons, um, in a commercial and, and sales marketing role. Um, and really excited to be, be have this partnership with IWFM. I think it's um, a really worthwhile. Um, relationship that we've got, um, really find some really worthwhile causes and, and really excited to, to what the next 12, 24 months is, is going to um, bring bring as part of um, us being together. So yeah, thank you. And thank you, Duncan. So um, that's the intro. That's who's on the webinar today. You'd be pleased to know. Again, encourage questions. There is a Q&A section at the end. But at this point, I'd like to hand over to Greg 
So it's going to go through his presentation around sustainability in FM and the 2020 vision. So Greg, I'm just going to have Brilliant, thank you all. Just went for the, the slides to click over. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd, I'd like to start by way of introduction in, in looking at this VUCA world, and it is something that has come up um, on a regular basis, both within the Navigating Turbulent Times webinar series, the IWFM have been running, and, in, and indeed in others. And it's, it's, it's a word you to describe, came from the 80s, and it's it's an acronym you to describe where where change happens and what that can result from. Just wait for my slides to scroll over. There we go. So so the, the the first of those for those that don't know is volatile. The second one is uncertain. The third is complex, and the fourth is ambiguous. And as I said, it was designed from a a leadership and management perspective to look at how change can affect um, potentially what's happening within business in relation to really four main things. Um, the first of all, as far as volatility goes, is, is the speed of change. As far as uncertainty is the extent of future predictability. From a complex perspective, is, is the variety of factors and how they interrelate. And then from ambiguous, it's either the clarity or, or lack of interpretation of the information you're getting. And I think with COVID-19, um, what we find, we we're very much in, in a VUCA world um, as we stand currently. Um, but is this something that may may also be predictable? We, we, we know it's happening, and I'd, I'd like to go back to this document, which um, was first produced in 2008. It was a result of the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, and it was a national risk register that was put together um, with the view of intending to capture a range of emergencies that might have a major impact or all or a significant part of the UK, um, providing a picture of, of national risk. And within the document, there was, there was this table. So it's looking at impact and likelihood of a, a range of scenarios as far as those civil contingencies. And while it was pandemic influenza, it was actually um, linked there on the on the slide. You will see it there. The pandemic influenza is the one right up at the top quadrant of that. If we move forward to 2017, um, again, the National Risk Register of Civil Contingency was provided. They'd obviously invested a little bit more in the in the graphics that they put with regards to the matrix. But again, up in that top corner is pandemic influenza. And if, if anything's to go by with the current situation, while we were aware it was going to happen, our, our, our level of planning for when it did become it did become a VUCA situation is, is something that no doubt we will look on, we will look back on once we've we've managed to control and, and negate the risks from COVID-19. In amongst both those though, there are there are other elements and we can see them there in both these graphs and these these are often natural hazards so they were elements such as flooding heat wave drought storms and gales wildfires snow and poor air quality they were also identified um, as as being major risks as far as the national plan goes and and are these ones that are also predictable and happening too well, the answer, the answer to that is yes, because not only did we have, if you remember, through November through to February, so November last year through to February this year, flooding throughout the UK, but over the period of time since then, these are some of the areas where we've had not just life-limiting, but life-changing flooding in various parts of the world. You will all also be familiar with the, the major fires we've had, again, not just in Australia and America, but in, in various other parts of the world, including that one at the end, Siberia. And one of the reports I was reading on that for the fires in Siberia during July was there was an area of Siberia on fire roughly the size of Belgium. So these are, again, significant, significant events. Pull one more into that. Um, is this quote on pollution? So pollution is so associated with an estimated 9 million deaths a year worldwide. This was from a, a quote from a BMJ article um, in 2017, which was based on a major study um, of 2015 looking at the global burden of disease. 
The report goes on to say, the study reported in The Lancet found that air pollution was a major contributor to the deaths and was associated with 6.5 million of them in 2015. Water pollution was implicated in around a further 1.8 million deaths. And just to give some idea of context around this, WHO, the World Health Organization, um, estimate globally at least 2 billion people um, use a drinking water source that is contaminated with feces. And 91% of the world's population live in places where air quality exceeds current WHO guideline limits for, for safe air. So it is a situation that, that, that is very VUCA, and it's not just in relation to pandemic, but in wider areas of which sustainability is a part. Knowing about them is the start. Being able to do something about them is obviously what, what the sustainability agenda is all about. And, and the IWFM have been looking at this for some time. So some background to where we are with, with the um, sustainability and FM survey. Um, first survey was produced in 2017, um, and as you can see from the slide, there, there were four main elements that came out of this, which was which was really not surprising insofar as it was very much the environmental sustainability agenda. So, energy, waste, water, and carbon were the were the major um, major areas to come out of that finding in terms of what organisations were looking at. We scroll forward to the 2011 survey. Um, again, just not those four areas. This expanded, so we started to see health and well-being and other areas start to come into flexible working, start to come into the consciousness of those who were responding back to the survey. But also remembering that at the time, the 2011, we were recovering from um, the market crash that had happened a few years before. Although interestingly, one of the questions that was asked was, how are you seeing this affecting your sustainability going forward? And, and the answer was no. And perhaps in looking at that from a different way, we can move forward to the 2015 survey, where we actually did see that there was a there was a drop. There was a 20% drop. This was looking at sustainability effectiveness over, over the, the length of the survey, so 2007 to 2015. And there was a 20% drop in those that thought their organizations were, were excellent or very good um, in terms of their sustainability effectiveness. So, so that there had been a change there. And in looking at this in a little bit more detail, and the major barriers that survey found, that again the graph explains itself there, all of them show considerable increase as far as the effect barriers were having on, on organizations delivering sustainability. But in particular, is that dark green graph that starts off as the lowest in the bottom left and goes up to being the, the highest in the top right, and that was organizational engagement. And this is where we started to see some nuanced change in maybe how sustainability was being viewed in organizations. And the year after that, um, 2016 survey, we started to have more of an issues around well-being and the social side of sustainability and social values started to come in and affect living wage, paying conditions, equality and diversity started to have a bit more of an influence, which could have a factor um, in the survey going forward. So arriving at the sustainability survey for 2020, um, this is a report that said it's, it's hot off the press, it's being released today. Excuse me, so in terms of looking at the, the demographics, um, these, is, these have held relatively true right the way throughout the life of the survey where vast majority of um, responders tend to be end users, um, as you will see from the graph, that's the white segment from the graph. And then the myriad of the colors of the other side, the makeup is typically um, FM companies, um, so facilities management companies, FM product uh, suppliers, FM service providers, consultancies, and then others tend to make up the majority of the, uh, those responders. With regards to level of organization, again, this stat has tended to endure through the length of the survey. 53% tend to be at managing director, CEO, or senior management level, about 30% uh, middle management, and then round about 10, 17% in this survey, um, facil uh, frontline managers and, and non-managerial staff tend to be those um, responding and organizational size. Is, is a very good demographic and again has been quite consistent through the survey where 
Businesses with um, up to 249 employees is about 26% of responders. Between 250 and 999 employees is 28%. Um, 1,000 to 4,999 is 24%. And then above 5,000 is 22%. So that's, that's, that's roughly um, a quarter of each of those market sectors. So it's a, it's a fair representation of organizations of, of various sizes. As far as the key findings go, a look at the, the importance of sustainability. And, and again, this is a metric we've been able to analyze over a period of time. Um, this is looking at it in terms of organizational level. And one of the, the really key findings that came out of this survey is that engagement is at the highest level it's ever been. Um, while executive management level has seen it's roughly stayed the same between 75 and 80 percent over the period of the, the survey. You will see that compared to previous surveys, both middle management and from the 2018 survey, that was up 12 percent. But frontline management and staff is now at 82 percent. It's up 26 percent on previous and is the highest level we've ever seen. So, so why, why might this be? And there was a number of um, areas um, hypothesized as part of this. Um, and to quote the report, could be a reflection of the broader sustainability agenda being adopted by organizations. That's certainly when we're seeing the organizational agenda is, is becoming a bit more, there's a, a bit more clarity to it. It's not just about environmental sustainability, it's bringing in social factors, it's bringing in other factors, and, and people are realizing that they're all part of the same process. Um, also with that, we've got more employees recognizing and becoming involved in these um, and seeing the benefits of the initiative and therefore identifying with that in the business. Increase could also reflect the greater awareness of sustainability um, across the population in general. And, and um, we only need to think back to um, the news Greta Thunberg's been getting or indeed the, um, the interaction with David Attenborough's programme on the sea to do with plastics. Um, and that's increasing awareness and understanding. Um, the other one, of course, um, could almost certainly be down to um, COVID-19 effect, um, both in terms of its direct and, in, and indirect impact. It is actually having in areas such as travel, in areas such as agile work, that again is identifying it as part of the, the sustainability agenda. So how does that relate to barriers and influences? And again, this is, this is an area we've been tracking for, for some time. As, as far as the barriers go, while there are a number of them, the, the top three in this survey were constraints around financing, physical constraints with regards to the environment um, people were in, and then a lack of an awareness and innovation and best practice of what's changing, what's new, and therefore what can we use. So they were the, they were the um, three main barriers. And again, they, they've tended to be quite consistent um, in recent years as far as the, the, the survey goes. What we see against that, to counterpoint it, is looking at influences that are driving the implementation of uh, sustainable practices. And, and again, this, this year's survey started to provide some, some nuance as to where we're going. The, the legal, the moral, financial, and the reputational drivers have all been strong um, in terms of sustainability and, and again, endured over, over the length of the time of the survey. What we have started to see is growth in other areas, and all, all these are showing slight increase, but in particular, it's drawing the attention to that one there on, on life cycle, which was showed a 14% increase um, over the, the results in 2018. Management and material risk was a 28% increase in responders um, to the um, 2018 survey. Pressure from employees and social pressure were 20 and 31% respectively, and could well be that awareness and that general understanding of sustainability further being, further being drivers towards that. But most noticeably, and again, possibly down to the COVID effect, is the ability to adopt new technology and new ways of working, which um, increased by 33%. So it was a significant increase in terms of those, those the, one of those areas, sorry, that is driving um, sustainability. Just to counterpoint that, and in terms of governance, um, and I'll quote you from the survey again, um, so this is under the heading of governance reporting priorities and objectives. 
It says, interestingly, all aspects of sustainability reduced in importance from 2018. So the overall importance of it seems to have come down um, across the majority of responders. But given that sustainability is seen as increasingly important by FM professionals, this could be a little bit difficult to fathom. Could be explained in part by COVID, um, which in turn has led to many organizations actually being in, in survival mode, therefore with less attention on some areas of sustainability in the short term, as well as maybe some less areas of sustainability priorities starting to emerge. May also be that areas of sustainability are being shared beyond the specialist sustainability community and are now becoming more mainstream. So we're seeing a number of influences there of who's doing what and how are they doing it in terms of relevance to the business. So we'll look at that in terms of targets and again, targets for which um, key performance indicators are set that, that are measured on. This, this graphic as well has stayed pretty much in terms of um, the, the, the types of response over the last four to five years, where, where it is and where you see it currently in, in terms of respondents and what's being measured on. There has again been some slight changes. Carbon management, for example, saw an increase this year, um, moving up above above waste from third excuse me next element we had there is health and well-being which is another one that moved up considerably from ninth we had sustainable travel that moved slightly up from 14th and then social value was the other one where we saw if we had to look at it more 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 um, higher increases than we would see generally um, again all these you could argue um, while they're they're mainstream areas of uh, sustainability also have that um, that COVID-19 effect in them you know if we take our energy use in buildings health and well-being particularly mental health and well-being travel as we've seen over the last six months and then social value in terms of what we do and we've all seen them grow but that that may not be um, that may not be the whole story. One of the other things and the question that came out of the survey was um, looking at sustainability in clients organisations. So this was from the um, FM suppliers and providers perspective. And this year, the results in, in relation to this showed that there was a slightly confusing picture around sustainability in clients organisations. Um, Conversely to what is happening in the FM professionals' own organisations, responders said that sustainability, again, seemed to have reduced in importance in clients' organisations. While over four and five respondents still believe it is important to their clients, there, there was a huge drop in the numbers who think that their clients see it as extremely important. So it had gone from being extremely important to just important. At the same time as we saw this, when asked how clients understood sustainability, only one in 10 felt that their clients had an excellent understanding, which was another big drop from 2018. Again, this could reflect a widening knowledge gap between the service providers and their clients, or may suggest that more sustainability initiatives are, are being driven or are being seen as being driven from elsewhere. And perhaps the compliance sustainability professionals aren't, aren't as engaged with that. So that could be another element informed out the survey. Two specific areas, so having had a look at the key drivers, were social value and well-being. So over the last three to four years within the survey, as, as well as looking at general trends, we targeted one or two key and high important areas, which social value and well-being were the two um, we looked at in 2020. And there was a theme, definitely, sorry, a theme emerging with social value. So to have a look at the 2018 report, um, these were the most important activities, as you'll see, in delivering social value, and there was a range of them there from 2018, the vast majority of which were seen as being very, very important. It was, it was a high-profile activity. If we track forward to the 2020 um, re respondents to that, while they all still remain very important, what we've actually found is that for all of them, Again, they, they decrease slightly. This, this is definitely a trend throughout the survey. And in conjunction with the survey, we also run a workshop and uh, have a number of industry professionals from, from, from across um, the, the FM sector um, to look at some of these and provide further nuance to the findings. And 
particularly with regard to workshop participants, that there, there was a feeling there that there remains a lack of consensus on what social value stands for, and that it will be a real challenge to reach a definition that is flex enough to meet, flexible enough, sorry, to meet the local needs and is fit for all. Service providers do feel that many clients' understanding of social value is still evolving and that a lack of a uh, strategic vision means there is often a poor fit between what the requirements requirements are and the service, provi service provider's ability to meet these. And an example during the workshop was given um, of a local authority project that required employment of apprentices, but the length of time of the contract actually didn't support the apprentice scheme um, that, that was being requested. Equally, um, one of the other things is participants felt that there, there remains a lack of clarity over um, what should be measured and by whom as far as social value goes, which is which is something that um, the IWFM we know are already looking at um, through the, the social value portal, et cetera, and looking at other areas um, around that, as indeed we are within the special interest groups ourselves. So on to well-being, um, which is a, not just from a physical perspective, but a, a, a mental health perspective again, and, and is one of those other areas that, that, that is very high priority at the moment. Um, if we look at areas of well-being being invested in, um, all of them, again, particularly mental health, um, physical health and exercise, and working practices, looking at flexible working, have a high level of investment in them, which again is not surprising in the current situation and, and, and a re possibly a reflection of COVID, would be one element to look at that. But this was actually growing before that. So it may have had an accelerating effect, but it was certainly one area that over the last three three to four surveys we've seen has been, uh, been quite a big increase. And, and that can be identified with the amount being invested in it. In terms of how it's being reported, and you can see the figures there, so ranging from informally to part of CSR or using their own metrics. Most interesting one for me here was we do not measure in any way, which is which is actually only 14%. So we've got 86% of organizations are now looking um, or for measuring and reporting what they're doing as far as their well-being goes. How this consolidates in the future again, we don't know but it's one of those to look at. Um, also is one where we've, we've got one of those ideal fits between, between departments because while from a, a mental health perspective, um, stress and anxiety it could be very much HR takes the lead from a, a physical health exercise and indeed a, a, a building well-being. So areas such as air and water quality is obviously the domain of the FM. So potentially a, a, a collaboration there to the best effect of both departments. One other thing we looked at as part of the survey this year was the impact of sustainability over the last 12 months. And, and that was the question we asked, how has sustainability your, affected your organization over the last 12 months? Um, and they were the answers. Um, I'm not gonna give you uh, what the results were from that. Um, that would be for you to take the report away and read it, which is, which is hopefully one of my um, takeaway messages from today. So if you want to know more about that, there were 20 areas covered in that and, and how, how those relate um, to, to your business, the wider FM community, um, please take the report, have a look and read. Thank you very much indeed for your time. I'm now gonna hand back to Peter. Thank you, Greg, and uh, you've done a stellar job there of going through uh, a comprehensive, comprehensive report that is actually released today, just to remind uh, viewers, listeners, that that will be available on our website. So uh, Greg's gave you a little bit of a teaser there. Just to remind people, please stick around. We will have a Q&A. So I would encourage people to start using the question um, function and maybe just put some of your views down of yeah, your sustainability agenda within your organization okay we won't read them out if if you if you're worried about that but actually some of the views would would be good just to understand people's feelings on sustainability within their organization and particularly uh, the current climate we're in uh, and for the future what, what does the sustainability look in your respective organizations so thank you greg just to remind you viewers as well that the webinar is being recorded so um, this will be available for people shortly afterwards so if your clients friends colleagues can make today's webinar it will be made available so please use the Q&A function if you can 
Now, from next uh, next up, um, we've got a stellar speaker, Nenko, who obviously Greg's kindly gone through the um, survey that Nenko kindly um, um, supported, and obviously you can see their change for the better. So, obviously, uh, interesting to see how Nenko's role is going to do do that in terms of their organisation. So today we have Duncan Edward, Head of New Business and Partnerships, has run you through a, a presentation today. So Duncan, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you today. Um, firstly, I really want to thank Peter and all his colleagues at IWFM for all the great work they have put into this year's survey. IWFM were very much early adopters when it came to focusing on sustainability. And this year's report really does contain a lot of invaluable insight that I'm sure will be of great use to the members and the broader business community alike. I'm conscious that some of you may never come across an ENCO before. Um, as an organisation, we've been around for 50 years um, and our heritage has, has very much been an energy management consultancy. Um, and we work currently with over 500 leading corporate businesses and, and public sector organisations. Over time, um, we've seen a dramatic shift in the nature of these conversations that we're having with our clients. And back in the day, it was all about price and just procuring energy cheaply. Then the conversation shifted to how I can optimize my energy consumption and spend less. But increasingly, our customers are just as focused on carbon reduction and also the broader aspects of sustainability. So as their focus has shifted, so has ours. So that we now see ourselves as a trusted advisor and consultant around environmental sustainability who can help organizations understand and measure their current performance, be clear what they're trying to achieve, and then work with us to implement the required solutions. <clears throat> so in my time with you over the next 20 minutes, I just want to pick up on a few of the key themes. Firstly, just to talk a little more about the changing conversations that we're having with clients and what we see as some of the key opportunities in helping to define a more, pro a more effective approach to delivering sustainability. My colleagues and I don't often find the need to quote Lenin, but his reflection that there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen certainly really seems appropriate in the spring of 2020. Tens and thousands of someone's friends and colleagues are no longer with us. The UK economy has seen the greatest fall in economic activity since records began, and many of us have encountered what feels like a fundamental and permanent shift in how we organise our workplace. But despite all this, I remain convinced that embracing sustainability with even greater focus is at the core of enabling change for the better. As I mentioned earlier, we are finding that we are having changing conversations with our clients. The fact that this survey has seen a dramatic increase in responses, some 40% year on year, and engagement from IWFM members is, I think, testament to the sense that many of us want to do the right thing but also the growing pressure for consumers and investors alike. Only a couple of Sundays ago, David Attenborough's latest impassioned plea for action was on the TV. But I'm equally convinced that embracing an ambitious sustainability plan can be the route to creating a long-term competitive advantage and can really underpin the commercial success of an organization. Think about the consumer brands that are increasingly placing their ethical credentials at the core of the proposition. Brands such as Brewdog are key, are key examples. Property companies such as JLL are focusing on the greening of their estates on the investment funds, looking afresh at their portfolios. I'm sure that the leaders of many of these businesses are motivated to do the right thing, but they also recognize the changing market pressures and rise of new technologies. They know that a comprehensive sustainability strategy is a route to higher margins, greater rental values, and better investment yields. We really can all be green capitalists if we create a clear and holistic sustainability plan that has hardwired the organization's overall corporate objectives. But you also need to know where you are starting from, and this survey highlights a worrying lack of relevant KPIs in many of the organizations. With the old mantra of what get measures gets managed, we find that this step is often at the heart of addressing the lack of board buy-in, available funding, or resource constraints that the survey respondents also referenced. Understanding what is material and having the right data and insight can often be key to unlocking resources and then being able to chart demonstrable value, adding progress to stakeholders. 
at Anenco, our focus is not only on helping organizations shape a clear and actionable strategy, but ensuring that we also support them in its active implementation, backed by clear data and insight. We know that many IWFM members are already doing great work to deliver positive sustainability outcomes to their organizations. But this survey perhaps again highlights the value of access to and representation of the profession at board level to ensure that aspiration and intent can be backed by the efficient delivery of a grounded plan. What we find is that having a rigorous methodology and approach to strategy development can really help to keep the board and your key stakeholders really engaged and committed to unlock the required resources. But also that the activity you do is going to have a material impact on the organization achieving its overall goals. So I just want to share with you a few top tips on what we find in our experience works well. So at the start of the journey, at the extremes, there are probably two types of organisations. At one end is an organisation that truly gets it and has clearly articulated sustainability strategy, specific KPIs and a well-resourced delivery plan. But in Maine, we find these sorts of, sorts of organisations are few and far between and quite rare beasts. Despite the immediate economic impact of the pandemic, we still though find that most organisations are motivated to affect change, but have no clear detailed idea of their current performance where specifically they are trying to get to or how to get there. Now, what our research has shown us that many organizations don't have a sustainability strategy that is aligned to their corporate plan and don't have real buy-in or commitment from the board. This typically means that they end up implementing well-meaning activity, but then struggle to get investment approved or can't show what the real value has been to the business. So we really can't stress how important we think it is to engage with key influence in the C-suite to ensure that any sustainability plan is aligned to your long-term goals, that everyone collectively understands why they need to change and that they are setting realistic and measurable targets, not just plucking aspirations out of the air. The risk is that you miss out this stage. More junior stakeholders will be working really hard, but there's a lack of ownership and commitment and the board won't sign off the business case or commit the required resource. So the fundamental at the outset is to understand. Why do you need to change? What are the pressures from customers, supply chain, investors, or your people that you need to respond to? What are the key aspects of the corporate plan that sustainability can support? What then are the facets of sustainability that are most material to achieve your goals? A combination of these things, in essence, becomes the scope and objectives against which subsequent, more detailed plan is checked to ensure that it really is meeting the organization's needs. We find it helps to undertake a workshop with the key stakeholders. But before you hold the session, I really would encourage you to do some desk research on your own organization prior to the session to understand what their public commitments might have been. In, for instance, your annual report, it's amazing what you've committed publicly or on your website that actually hasn't been communicated or actioned internally. I would also have a look at what your competitions are doing, your competitors are doing, sorry, and perhaps undertake what structured interviews or questionnaires with those people in the organization that is most important to influence. So at the beginning of the workshop, it would be useful to play back to the attendees where you think you are and ensure that that's a shared understanding and agreement on the starting point. We then suggest you look at the broader stakeholders to understand where their drivers for change are coming from. So, that, so our, their investors, for instance, now make investment decisions based on more sustainability criteria or is it that some customers are demanding change from their supply chain? We advise you to look at what are the major external factors that are important and impacting on your organization. And we'd also work through a SWOT analysis to look where the biggest threats or equally opportunities seem to be. A tool called a materiality matrix can then be a useful way to highlight what matters the most. It's then important to agree the priorities and agree in the next steps what we're seeking to do is ensure that there is a collective buy-in that you need to do something. There's a broad understanding of what good might look like and you've built a relationship and access to C-suite to ensure ongoing buy-in. You obviously wouldn't want to confirm, sorry, you obviously would want to confirm what you have committed to in a succinct report that is a justification for further action and of course investment. Now, I'll briefly take you through the rest of the stages of our methodology and what we can find help move from good intentions to action. So now we move on to define where building on a, where, where building on a summary report will play back what sustainability means to the organization. 
why it is important to you and what the reasons are to act. At this stage, we would want to set out broad targets. For example, when you are looking to achieve net zero and be, and be clarified over who has management accountability <clears throat> and is leading and supporting your program. You would want output from this stage to be a more detailed definition of what they are aiming to, aiming to achieve. So at Outline, we'd also look to flesh out the plan further and put some fuel under the fire of this burning platform by sharing the impact of doing nothing. You'll have broadly showed the scope of the programme and confirmed what are the key measures of success. So at this point, we're clear what we're going to do, how we're going to measure it, and what the broad timescale is. This might seem all a bit tortuous, but it really does seem important. So it really is important to keep circling back to ensure buy-in and commitment. So, at the design phase, you really do need to have the metaphorical boots on the ground and ensure that you have an accurate view of your current performance and can baseline the potential scale of improvement. Our head of solutions always says that the three most important things are data, data and data, by which he means you can't manage what you can't measure. I also say you can't measure what you can't see. If you have strong and clear KPIs, these will help you demonstrate performance improvement to stakeholders and produce robust business cases to justify investment. So, at Implement, the clue is in the name. It's all about active implementation of the agreed programme. But sustainability will touch many parts of the organisation and your solution will have a wide range of different facets and deliverables. In my experience, is that you really do need to ensure that you have an active project and program management function, both to avoid silos of activity within your organization, but also to engage with third parties across your supply chain that are likely to be part of the solution and delivery. Review. At the review stage, it's about ensuring that you can show key stakeholders the impact of the program, how it has supported the achievement of your overall corporate objectives, and that you are providing further data and insight that informs continuous improvement. So I know that some of, the, some of this may seem like statements of the bleeding obvious, but it's surprising the number of occasions where it doesn't happen, and in my view explains a lack of concerted action or clarity or purpose around sustainability that may, many organisations suffer from. We're living in a complicated world at the moment, and many of you will be facing real short-term pressures, but I really do believe that in getting real stakeholder buy-in, setting the right strategy, having clear data and insight, all go to create a robust plan that is hardwired into your organization's DNA. Obviously, if you think you might need a little help in that journey, please do get in touch, but I do think there's a real opportunity to get back to better. Thank you. And as I struggle with the technology, Duncan, I just want to say a massive thank you to you um, going through that presentation, the sense of a bit of a how-to guide as well. I know that's built on Anenco's foundations of how you do things there respectively, but I think it certainly tied in very nicely um, with today's presentations, obviously from, from Greg previously. So as promised to the audience, um, and hopefully Greg's still with us, and uh, I've put the webcams on so I can see you lovely people as well. Um, I'm here. So that's great. Lovely. I have asked for a, a questions to come in um, and again some great feedback on both your presentations so I know the joy of doing this live folks there's a few um ahs but this is the joy why we do it live um, so we have got questions in I will encourage um, questions to come in but a question for both of you that's um, a bit of a theme coming in from the audience is Obviously, with um, social economic factors at play and, and COVID obviously links to the navigating turbulent times and obviously that other economic aspect of Brexit, which wasn't mentioned through the presentations, but isn't actually going to go away. Is there a danger that the sustainability agenda, which I appreciate Greg on the survey, did show some, I guess, reduced interest or knowledge, or you could say, um, is there a danger that we could go back or do you see these phases as sustainability will always be important but I don't want it slipping off the board agenda so in a rambly way I'm just concerned that 
is there a danger that the sustainability agenda because of those factors may may slip back to how it was five ten years ago so Greg, could uh, you kick off on that yeah of course um i i I, th I think i think the simple answer is no i think from from now on um as we're saying it's, it's going to be interesting to plot this with with the next surveys as well but it's it's this this drive from the bottom up is is going to make it more important and and in terms of the area we're touching on is understanding that sustainability isn't just about environmental sustainability that's that's a fundamental part to the mix but it's looking at the social side and the business side it's looking at staff recruitment and retention it's looking at living wage it's looking at equality and diversity and and, and all all these are on the agenda in different ways and they're all they're all fighting um they're all fighting for attention on the on the corporate agenda absolutely um but they're, they're all they're all going to continue to do so and, and those organizations the best ones are going to be the ones that identify where they are in that and where they can affect these to best affect for their business the wider community and the environment no that's great and apologies my screen seemed to jump onto my emails there i guess duncan in terms of your um an ENCO's point now, obviously it seems like as an organization you've had to adapt and I think adaptability is quite an important word for individuals and business. How has, how has that um, changed over time and, and to ensure that a business and business similar to an ENCO it maintain what you do essentially and build on the sustainability agenda? So just what interest how an ENCO's adapted over these issues that let's be honest with COVID no one could foresee even though Greg did outline his presentation it may have been foreseen from the government back in 2017 but um, from an ENCO's point of view how have you adapted over that period? Um, well, as a business we, we, we reacted you know extremely well um, and, and you know we got everybody moved it from, from, from office to working from home extremely quickly um, with, with literally minimum disruption to our customer base I think what we find, um, and we're quite fortunate in a way, that um, we, we have a broad mix of, of clientele um, and obviously energy become very much high on the agenda. Um, so, you know, we, we had, you know, our large amount of NHS customers where we, we, we saw a noticeable increase of usage, of energy usage, because they were open, more people were going in, um, more machinery was being used. So maybe some of our retail customers who were, were shutting up shop, so to speak, so that they weren't using energy. So. We had to be very, very much adaptive and supportive of them because um, we, 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 we then almost become a much more of an advisory to say you, you, you're still using energy when you haven't got somewhere open. So we, we, we became sort of come almost like a, a come back to this word trusted advisor, which I particularly like. But you know, we, we, we were really helping people uh, to, to, to get to grips because energy became a really, really big expense in the past six months has become right at the top of the agenda in terms of you know some people actually realizing how much of an expense it actually was and how much it was affecting the bottom line and by doing something about um about the, the energy spend and, and and the energy usage and looking at the data um it's, it's highlighted some real key areas where people can reduce their carbon footprint as well as save money so we've had to really adapt and, and be different in the way we've approached um people's um, usage spend and, and how they actually read and, and analyze the data that, that they've got. Well, that's quite interesting because there has questions come in about tech and data and obviously as a head of research, um, well, been in research now for nearly 18 years. Yes, folks, I, I do look like this. In terms of um, the importance and power of data, because I do remember going into MI many moons ago for the respective organisations and it used to be seen as a bit of a nice to have. Now I'm not speaking for all organisations but certainly the power of data for informed decision making. So for both you and uh, Duncan and Greg, how much does that concern you about the lack of KPIs and how people are still basing important decisions on a lack of data stroke evidence uh, Greg could you kick off is that that is that something you're really experiencing on the ground with your respective clients it's it's m more I think more generally Peter it's 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 one where um, we, we generate we generate vast amount of data in, in all sorts of ways and, and new technology and new ways of working is, is, is going to continue to do that I think the key is 
is understanding what data you're gathering, why you're dating it, why you why you're gathering it, where it's relevant to the business, and using it in that basis. Because otherwise, you just end up with data overload, and you've got so much there that you, you, it, it, it's not telling you anything. So, so very much around um, as as came out of some of the survey is making sure people clearly understand that as a business what 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 they're doing and, and where those areas they're going to focus on and then make sure they gather the the key elements of that data they want um, because otherwise if you just start recording everything um, you, you you never end up doing anything but trying to manage the bits of data you've got as opposed to you know it's, it's the three elements of data information and knowledge when you've got the data what information is that telling you and then what how can you use that to provide knowledge on on where your business is going and what you're doing? And Duncan, how is that is that similar from from the Enenco world and your experience around power, the use of data and obviously links to the the concern around the KPIs that came out in our survey? No, massively. In in the past six months, um, we have very much led. Um, you know, I'm head of new business, so we speak to clients, the new clients to to, to the organisation, and very much we lead by. Um, taking their data, back testing it against previous years, and then presenting it to them in a format to to help them understand, you know, how they're using it, where they're using it, looking at times, etc. They're using it, and then, you know, even to, to the extent of putting that against production times, against kind of some of their assets and their plant equipment. Um, you know, simple examples of where you know somebody had a fantastic asset list, they had a breakdown of all their printing equipment. They knew what equipment outputted the highest amount of or, or consumed the most um, power, um, yet they were using that at the peak times by simply us highlighting that if they moved that equipment two hours either side of, of the, 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 the peak time of using energy, it would be, uh, represent substantial savings. So it's kind of matching that data to how they use it, the time they use it, and the plant and the equipment and the estate that, that they use it within. Yeah, and it's wonderful because we start these Q and A's, and we get we get a number of questions in, and now they're flooded in, which I'm struggling <laughs> to keep. They're literally coming in like this, and I'm like, ah, the joy of being a host and doing it live. So thank you for the questions. Um, we will go to one here, and it's from from John Barnes. I could make a reference to football, but John, you've probably <laughs> heard that numerous times before. I don't think it is the ex England football. I hasten to add. Never knew. Uh, you never know. Um, but thank you for the question, John. He's, he said about the question that uh, in terms of the, the intent, the intent's always there. I think everyone recognises that sustainability is important. And I think the knowledge and education of that's growing year on year. But again, one of the biggest challenges is costs. So how do you get it? I've worked in, well, represented FM for the last six years, as I mentioned, Greg, we've worked on this survey, and the amount of FM conferences, webinars we've been to about the cost versus value debate. How how do you see the initiatives benefit that overcome that initial outlay, outlay but the return long term is benefit to the individual and the organisation? So I wondered... How do you come over that massive hurdle of cost? I'm afraid sometimes it does go back to the basics of the finances. It, it, it does, and it, it's it's part of the package. Um, I refer you back to the presentation and the, the, the 2015, where we saw that 20% drop in sustainability effectiveness, and, and not just organizational engagement, but some of the other areas that came out of that to why it's dropped, and, and the, the hypothesis was that a lot of the low-hanging fruit as far as sustainability had been picked, and that perhaps this was a time where organisations organisations needed to step back and take a look at themselves, and it, it was these bigger projects. So you know, it's where you're replacing capital kit that has a high cost, and and how do we go about doing that? And is the appetite in the business to do that? Um, interestingly, going forward, and particularly from a, from using an energy in a building stock um, e example, um, where we are now with, with COVID and more agile working, um, will we see a huge repurposing of our building stock to maybe not just office, but a, a mixture of office, residential, retail, and, and other use? And, and if so, where how are we going to make that attractive from a sustainability and an energy perspective as well? And and with this repurposing, perhaps that will allow us to do the investment because certainly elements such as contracts, if you if, if you, you have a five-year contract on a, on a multi-let building, trying to put um, 
a, a project through to to replace a chiller that's going to be there for 20 years but going to be a lot more efficient is is a difficult proposition um, and it, it's looking at maybe everybody taking a step back and discussing that and deciding what they want to do you know is is there a compromise in terms of length of lease to quality of fit out and and and, and status of what's being done with the capital care I don't know, but these are questions that we're, we're going to have to start looking at as, as we move into a post-COVID world. And Duncan, from, from the world of uh, your world and, and an ENCO in the politest sense, how, how would you say that quality of data has been in your experience? Is the data of good quality to make those decisions or is it safe to say it's varied? I don't want to answer the question for you, but it, what in your experience, what is the quality of data like? In the main, the, the, the quality of data that, that we receive is, is, is reasonably good. Um, you know, if, if you take it from the meter side, um, it, it comes from the, the, the energy companies, the power companies, they send us the data. It's normally in, you know, in good formats, normally accurate. Um, there may be some inaccuracies, inaccuracy, sorry, regarding uh, certain charges or um, taxes and, and levies that have been applied, which, which we can look at. Um, that's sometimes where there's, there's some errors. Um, but it, it, in terms of getting data from a building um, through like sub metering um, or, or circuit level monitoring or circuit level metering, et cetera, that's, that's where I think there is a bit of a, a, a massive gap um, in terms of, you know, truly understanding when it comes into a building, that's great, but when it's distributed throughout a building, where actually is it going? You know, who's using what, how, how it's being distributed, who's paying for it, who's being spit, et cetera. Um, and I think going back to the question previously, previously as well is, um, you know, the question is, I think whatever project you, you, you want to take, you, you obviously want to have a, an ROI at the end of it. And I think, um, you know, by, by putting a lot of this, this stuff together through assets, through how you buy, um, you know, understand, you know, the compliance issues, also understanding what, what schemes are available there for you to be able to participate in to, to help reduce costs or help get money back or, or help to be, you know, part of a saving scheme, etc. They're all out there. Um, and, and I would say that, you know, you know, engaging people to look at a project for you, you know, have a firm ROI, you know, maybe both of you have some, some you know, uh, you know, skin in the game so that you, you're both there trying to achieve the same goal. Um, and, and benefit equally from it. So tying in with that, and we've had a question in around, um, I'm not sure I'm keen on the phrase, but I'll go with the, the actual question. So I don't want to offend the question, but I think I just have. But in terms of where do you find the best in terms of quick wins for sustainability? So is there such a thing as a quick win around the sustainability agenda? Um, if I, if, you know, for, for my, the, the quick wins are staff education, understanding and messaging. Um, if you start at, within your own organization and educate people from, and I, I've worked with, you know, major retailers where they've just put notices up on, on walls to turn off taps, to turn off lights. Um, and I even presented once to, to, to I won't name and shame them, but um, not that it's too much of a shame, but I, I once presented to a large mobile phone organization and somebody asked me a question and said, I'm not trying to be funny or rude, but how do you save energy? They, they literally didn't know. And I kind of said, well, it's a great question, actually. And I'm standing in an auditorium in front of 300 plus people. Um, I'm presenting on a, on a PowerPoint screen behind me. Um, and there's about 200, 300 lights on in the room. Um, we've got the curtains wide open, so the light's coming in. Do we really need the lights on? You know, how many people here have got their laptops and phones plugged into the various hot desks around the building? And most people put their hands up and say, well, why, why are they plugged in? When you when they're, they're charged, but why do you need them charged? You're going home after this, or you're going to go and work for five or six hours. Um, and it was kind of like almost like a penny drop. It's like, wow, I, I just didn't realise. So to me, staff education, understanding, and messaging is, is definitely the first place to start. The education is obviously key key on this subject, and I think it's an area that. Uh, since the Institute's trying to address, obviously, for our survey on our SIG, um, Greg, and as chair of that SIG, did you want to add anything to that, particularly around the education piece? I, I think, yes, as, as part of the development of the of the special interest group, we're, we're, we're actually looking, we've, we've developed a pledge, we have a number of areas where we're using the, the, the survey to look at the, the, the skills within the SIG and, and more broadly how 
um, sustainability is, is, is affected by FM and how FM affects sustainability. Um, so certainly if, the, if there's anybody listening who would, who would like to join us, um, we'd, we'd be more than happy to do that. We're always looking at, there are spaces on the committee. Um, so if, if there are anybody out there, we'd, we, we'd love them to, uh, to, to join us and get involved um, in, in looking at this. And, and, and the, you know, the challenges, but, but the, the huge opportunities there are out there for the, for the profession. Um, in, in this particular area. So sustainability is, is a natural fit with FM and FM is a natural fit with sustainability. Hmm. I guess um, a question and some themes that come through and I just want to thank you listeners, viewers for sending all your questions. I'm trying to keep up to speed with them as best we can. Um, we talk about people, we talk about well-being at the heart of that is, is people at the end of the day and that's probably become more prevalent particularly the difficult times we've had over the last months that really bringing people together and engaging with your workforce has been more paramount than ever but how important is it engaging with your staff i will follow because there's obviously a follow-up there and people in driving the sustainability performance so i guess um chaps it's more around a little bit of a how to those skeptics out there how do you get from from right from your office cleaner right through to the ceo buying around the um the sustainability agenda so greg do you want to kick that off how 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 do you how do you build that culture within an organization you, you use the word there people it's one word it's, it's it's culture and 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 it's about you know the my my best or the best definition of culture i've heard is is it's the way we do things around here and and that's what it should be about it you know it's 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 everybody's job sustainability in an organization is 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 everybody's responsibility and everybody can can input to that um certainly in the early days with regards to recycling you you often had people who would say um you know if i if i don't recycle this one plastic bottle is it is it really going to make that much of a difference but if you flip that on his head if you get everybody so you you, you know you get everybody in the uk does it once more once a week um, and certainly public opinion through David Attenborough has increased that further. That's, that's 60 million bottles each week we are, we are recycling more, and that, that has a positive benefit. It's, it's, all, it's, it's all down to culture. Culture is the thing you need to breed here. Um, and what we found this time is, again, look, go back to the survey, look at, the, look at how important sustainability is to an organisation. 75% of CEOs or MDs, um, a senior management, have always seen it as extremely important. Um, middle management slightly less, frontline managers and, and non-management staff often very less to where in 2018 it was 56%, it was just over half. That, that's gone up to over 86% now. If ever there was an opportunity to engage and have everybody change that culture, now seems to be the time to do it. Anything to add on that, Duncan, about obviously how you get it from the bottom to the top? So how do you create that culture right across organisations? Um, I, I, I also think, you know, culture, you're absolutely right, Greg. It has to be the culture of the organisation and the culture that you create. Um, I also think it has to be a team effort. Um, I think, you know, you have to get everybody involved at every layer, every layer and every level. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I had the privilege of working in professional sport and, I always used to tell a story of um, who won the World Cup for England in 2003. And most people put their hand up and go, Johnny Wilkinson, Johnny Wilkinson, Johnny Wilkinson. So I then play the clip back at the last five or six minutes. Um, and, and I say to people, just watch the clip and everybody's involvement in, in, in the build up to, to you know, Matt Dawson, who's just played 120 minutes of rugby, flicking the ball out to Johnny, he put it over with his right foot. Um, you know, no one, no one remembers Lewis Moody, I think, who after... I've been sitting on the bench for 98 minutes, had to come on and catch that final ball in the pouring rain. And kind of what I'm trying to get to is everybody in that team had, a, had an objective. They knew what they were trying to achieve. So it wasn't just Johnny put the ball over and gets all the glory. It was every member of that team knew what their job was, what they had to do and how, what point they had to get to. If you create that team spirit and that culture, you will succeed. And I think you would echo that, uh, Greg, as a passionate Welsh support. Or maybe the reference to England winning the World Cup, you kept a very steady face there. But um, I, 
Okay. As, we, as we stand, Pete, there was a still current Six Nations champion, so I won't. That's um... it. That's it. Well, having a split loyalties of Irish parents, maybe one day Ireland might win a World Cup, but that that might be open too much. Um, well, but well, 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 stranger well, things have happened, and maybe that's not a line to use on a navigating turbulent time series. <laughs> but there, there is actually. Um, a question that comes in that's a serious point rather than my limited knowledge of rugby hence the John Barnes reference if it was football Duncan I might understand but I do remember 2003 and I had a lot blacker hair then as well um in terms of um we talk about the VUCA world you started your Greg about that um and we focused last week with our conference around disruption really at the heart what the disruptors are now not that any of us are future forecasters that were super forecasters that were discussed at our conference last week, but do, do you see for the next six, 12 months, anything really changing? And yes, I did mention the B word that's come up in a couple of questions about the impact of Brexit. Has that, has that fully been really understood on sustainability, particularly in the UK? So, Greg, I know it's a broad question and a difficult question, but only fair. Is there anything we can future forecast? It, it, it is, um, and there there will be changes. Um, they're they're almost impossible to forecast. As if the last six months has told us anything, is that even those things that are predicted, and as far back as 2008, pandemic, okay, it was influenza was predicted. Um, when they do come along, VUCA still applies. Um, I would say it's the, the, the best thing people can do is, is actually make sure they understand where they are currently in terms of what they want to do. So that can vary, vary that. And, and in, in terms of VUCA, if we look at it from a sustainability perspective, perhaps, perhaps we need to change the narrative. So the sustainability perspective, if we make it viable, understood, considered and, and adaptable, um, it will help with that because you have you have a solid strategy to base on. If you make your activities verifiable, uniform, coordinated, and achievable, you've got those aims in there. You've got those things people can engage with. And from from an FM perspective, it's 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 visible in terms of the industry and and where the FM is adding clear value. Um, to the organisation, uncompromising in what needs to be achieved, creative in the solutions, and, and aspirational in what they're providing, not just from their, their organisation, but in terms of elevating the profession even further. Um, and, and if we have all those, you should be in a position where, will there be difficult times? Yes, there will, but you should be in a position where we can, we can adapt to, and we can make sure that what we've got in place is, is suitable for our organisation and, and the broader um, the broader environment, planet, and um, people within it. And Duncan, I guess from uh, the perspective of, of sport and business, we talk about there the rugby and structure and um, basically routine, discipline, and you keep repeat, 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 repeat. But obviously what's come out of those discussions today is around adaptability. So from an ENCO's point of view, how do you keep uh, agile to use another sport in reference in terms of agility but also from adaptability which is probably a key word here in these um, unusual times i guess from an enco's point of view how how do you keep abreast of all the, all these factors that some are predicted and some have just been unpredicted so a difficult question but just intrigued how an enco as a business um deal deal with these challenges um I, I hope I can answer it. <laughs> it's, it's a very, very good question. Either in the next six to twelve months, I, th I think from from an Enco's point of view uh, and from my point of view, I think we're very fortunate with the people that we have and the people that we employ. Um, we have some really good uh, analysts. We have some really good people that that analyse the markets, what's happening within the marketplace. We have some, you know, some great people on the ground in terms of our engineering team who are very close to. You know what's happening in in different industries and marketplaces. Um, so almost they're forward forecasting and, and almost second guessing what's going to happen, um, mainly based on their experience, their their knowledge of, of the industry and who they're working with. Um, and I think that's because we've got a closeness to our customers as well as uh, you know people who are who are looking at everything from the you know the the, the, the political market to the the financial market etc. Trying to predict what's going to happen. Um, and we also find that energy works in cycles as well, so just predicting what's going to happen when within those cycles. Um, for sure, energy was the lowest price it's been for, for many, many years, you know, during the pandemic, at the, the peak of the pandemic, it's only going to go up. 
um, the, the, the non-commodity you know pricing that's only going to go up and become more and more part of your bill um, so from, from our point of view it's making sure that um, you know we are feeding the best advice to our customers to to, to ensure they're, they're they're prepared for the future um, and the only bit of advice I can say is, is make sure that you're really really close to your energy partner because um, they're the ones that should be giving you the information giving you the market intelligence based on their knowledge to help you make informed decisions so a last probably a last question to fall on um or leave on i should say in terms of but and it's probably a, a, a question for you both certainly is um for those organizations and representatives that got the responsibility of sustainability within their organizations or may may have some influence over sustainability what would your advice be to them for the next six to 12 months around sustainability is Without knowing those individuals, it might be difficult, but any nuggets that the individuals could take away of a how-to? So linking to what you've just said there, Duncan, but Greg, is there anything you can add in terms of individuals listening today, listening to the results of the survey, listening to the challenges that Anenco um, and the how-to Anenco approach sustainability? Is there any advice that can be given to those individuals watching today's webinar? Yeah, download a copy of the 2020 <laughs> sustainability survey. Um, have a look through the findings and, and where they're applicable to your organization in terms of the, the makeup of your organization and who's doing what in these areas. Understand where you are currently and then how you can all start collaborating to make what you've got in place easier for you to deliver and better for your organization in terms of the results it's getting. No, that's great. And again, well, another plug for the report. And, and, and download the survey, have a look and use that as your basis to say, this is where we are currently, where are you and where do you want to be and how do we get there? But, but collaborate on it, look at where those touch points are within the organisation and who's doing what. And any closer and, remarks, Duncan, to add to that? I was going to say, give me a call. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I think going back to what I, I presented was, listen to your people, listen to your customers, listen to your supply chain and look at your competitors because you'll get some valuable insight and some valuable information of, of what they believe is the right thing to do. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, I think that again, there's a people element. Obviously, uh, we've had questions through around well-being, but I'm aware of time. So what I can promise listener viewers, those questions that couldn't be answered in our Q&A session, I will pass on to Greg and Duncan respectively, and we'll get back to you. But at this point, um, gentlemen, I want to say a massive thank you for your support on the webinar. I've got some closing slides now. Obviously, I've given some people insight into my own world of my inbox that popped up there so i just have to apologize for that but highlights this is real folks we keep it real so uh, again i want to say a massive thank you thank you to duncan and greg for your time today so thank you again thank you so that's our questions time. And again, um, thank you for those that sent the questions through. Yes, the 2020 report will be found here on our Insight Hub, which also has other research reports, good practice guides, guidance notes, content hubs, um, of which one is a sustainability content hub. So please look up there. That's got um, not only a survey on it, but guidance around sustainability, some of the policy work that our head of policy has been working on. So please go on our website and have a look at that. There's a, a raft of information on there. Yes, this COVID-19, we, we do have a number of pages that are updated regularly. This is a res resource that's um, been welcomed by members. Um, and as I say, it's updated regularly. So have a look on our website there. Also, we have a return to work section that's um, updated as well, which again, in the current climate is, um, well, difficult for, for everyone. So please have a look at um, those pages if you can. Um, we asked for this on all our webinars about case studies and best practice. So if you've got any that uh, link in with today's um, webinar, as well as the 20 other episodes we've done, please send them through to policy at iwfm.org.uk. Again, we love to share best practice and case studies from some indiv individuals that work in us from a day-to-day -day perspective. And from for, lastly, I just want to say a massive thank you to um, you listeners viewers to 
Here are 2020 sustainability survey results, some of the highlights there from Greg Davis, um, supported by Anenco. And obviously we went on to Duncan that discussed some of the how-tos from an Anenco perspective around this agenda. So our next episode, number 22, is next Wednesday. So please look, at, look out for that. We also got another webinar happening tomorrow, which is part of our community. So please look out that. There's details on the website, so if you can, join that. Just to remind people, this webinar has been recorded. So um, again, this will be shortly uploaded on our website, along with the 2020 report that was at the heart of this presentation today. So thank you very much. Hopefully, hope to see you on the webinar again, I'm sure, and, and take care, everyone. Thank you again.